Hello and welcome to another Pedro Worldwide Journal Club. Today we're going to be discussing a systematic review of preoperative exercise training for people with lung cancer and it was co-authored by Associate Professors Catherine Granger and Vin Cavalieri and published uh, towards the end of last year. We've got a great panel today who are going to be discussing prehabilitation for people with lung cancer. So we might get started by introducing ourselves to you. Uh, we might start with Catherine. Thanks, Lara. Hello, I'm Catherine Granger. I am from Melbourne, Australia. I work at the University of Melbourne and at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And my background is physiotherapy and my specialty is the role of exercise for people with lung cancer to support their recovery. Thank you, Lara. And Zoe? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Zoe Merchant. Um, so my background is as an occupational therapist. Um, I'm here today because I am the allied health professional clinical lead for the Prehab for Cancer and Recovery program, which is a system wide um, prehab and rehab program for people with um, lung, colorectal and esophagogastric cancer based in Greater Manchester in the United Kingdom. Um, and I've been involved in that service ever since its inception um, four years ago. Thanks, Zoe. And Matt? Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Everson. So I'm a consultant in respiratory medicine uh, and I work in Greater Manchester in the UK alongside Zoe. Um, I'm also the, the clinical lead for lung cancer for the region of Greater Manchester. So I'm involved in um, developing and delivering new services uh, within the lung cancer pathway across the region. And Nicola? Hi everyone, I'm Nicola Burgess. I currently work as a clinical physiotherapist in the outpatient setting here in Melbourne, Australia as well. Uh, and I am also an early career researcher, hoping to undertake my PhD next year and have a particular interest in prehabilitation. Thanks, Nicola. And I'm Lara Edbrook. I'm the Pedro Education and Training Committee member, and I'm also a physio researcher. I work at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne and also at the University of Melbourne. So we might get started uh, with the first question, which I might throw to you, Catherine, perhaps if we could start off by uh, having a conversation about what you think the key implications are of your systematic review findings. Thanks, Lara. I mean, this, this was really exciting for Vin and I when we published the update. Um, obviously, our first iteration of this Cochrane review came out in, in 2017 and, and as per the Cochrane guidelines, they, they're updated regularly. Um, so for me, the, the, the key finding was the differences that we had in five years, that we now had high certainty evidence on the reduction in risk of developing the post-operative pulmonary complication for people who go through an exercise program before surgery for lung cancer. So we couldn't uh, claim that in the last review, but obviously the evidence has grown so much in five years, it doubled the number of trials and the number of participants. And, and then to be able to sort of um, come up with that, that conclusion, we we're very you know, delighted with that outcome. And can you tell us a bit, often when we think about prehabilitation, we think about um, multimodal programs that involve things in addition to exercise like nutrition or uh, smoking cessation or psychological support. Can you tell us about the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the review and um, did interventions that included more than exercise get included in your review or not? Yeah, so this is a really important point because obviously today we're somewhat talking about prehabilitation but so Vin and I took the um, the direction with this paper, we were looking at exercise training. So we weren't looking at a multimodal traditional prehabilitation program. And you know, I, I reflect back to when we started this piece of work and, and Vin and I started talking about the need for this copper review back in 2013. So it's it's 10 years ago. The field has completely changed what, what this preoperative care looks like for patients. But no, our, our original question was around the role specifically of exercise, and we've continued, continued on that. So what our, our claims and, and the results we've found are really only, only generalizable to exercise programs. We um, the inclusion criteria were randomized control trials that were that included people with non-small cell lung cancer undergoing surgical resection. 
that could be via open or minimally invasive surgery. Um, and the intervention group went through a pre-operative exercise training program that was at least one week long in duration. So there are, Larry, I'm sure you'll notice in the Cochrane review, in fact, one large trial that was excluded um, by, by the group over in Canada that was a multimodal prehabilitation program. And I'm very keen to hear today from Matt and Zoe about their experience of, of a more traditional prehab program because that, that wasn't so much the focus of this Cochrane review, but it's so important um, to consider now. I think that leads really nicely into now talking a bit about the program over in Greater Manchester. So Zoe and Matt, we'd be really, really keen to hear your experiences of um, telling us what your program involves and uh, what, how you went about setting it setting it up and sort of the challenges and enablers along the way. It would be great to, to hear that. I'm going for ladies first, especially um, post International Women's Day. Yes. Um, so, so the Prehab for Cancer and Recovery program came about um, within Greater Manchester because um, I think there was a lot of work that was done on um, preoperative care for patients, um, very much thinking about um, ERAS, so, you know, that enhanced recovery. Um, and within those pathways, there was a recognition that actually, um, especially for cancer patients, you really need to do more than just give people that kind of education about some of the interventions they should be doing um, to improve their outcomes related to um, cancer surgeries. And so we were given some transformation funding four years ago um, by our Cancer Alliance, which is our kind of organisation within our system um, looking to improve outcomes for cancer patients um, to start this prehab service. And we were very much focused on the idea that it wasn't going to be for a small group of people. We really wanted to try and do something that was a system wide delivery, because I think working very closely with Matt and others, we knew there was, um, you know, the, an emerging evidence base about the interventions for prehabilitation. Um, but what we really wanted to get into was the feasibility of actually trying to deliver this at scale um, across a system, across various cancer pathways. Um, and so we worked very hard to do that and um, decided on three of the major surgical pathways. So lung, colorectal and esophagogastric. Um, and the criteria was really um, any patient who lived in the, our area, um, Greater Manchester, is a, it's a large conurbation in the UK. It's, we've got three million people living here. Um, so anybody who lived in this area um, and was diagnosed with um, one of those three cancers I mentioned being offered surgical treatment would be eligible to be referred into our service. Um, but what we did do was rather than trying to base the service within all the 10 major hospitals across the region, we recognised that by working with our leisure providers, so all the leisure centres um, and exercise um, facilities across the region, we would be able to deliver something um, that was very close to people's homes. We would hope that would have better uptake. Um, and it wasn't just about prehab as well. We wanted to be able to give rehab as well. So it was kind of through the whole continuum of their cancer pathway. And then there was also that kind of secondary aim of um, longer term behavioural change as well. So we were very lucky that we've got um, over 90 facilities in Greater Manchester that patients can access the service within. Um, and they're referred by their clinical team, so by Matt and his colleagues, when they're seen um, after their diagnostics and that diagnosis of cancer. Um, at that same point, um, they are considered for prehab and the majority of patients are then referred through a online portal. And then they are seen within a couple of days by our prehab for cancer team um, very likely to where they live for a, a very comprehensive assessment and then they're given their prehab um, interventions um, where they're intensively seeing exercise specialists for that period of time running up to their treatment and then again after their treatment for 12 weeks for their rehab. So I, if I hand me over to Matt maybe in terms of the focusing more on the lung patients within prehab service. Uh, yeah thanks Sarah. Um... So I guess firstly, it's um, just congratulations to Catherine and her co-author for this work. The, the Cochrane reviews are just so rightly, so well respected and so influential in clinical care because of how robust the methodology is behind it. Um, and there, there's, you know, across the world, there are the believers in prehab that are really desperate to implement prehab services and work like this um, is is so important for people like me and Zoe who have conversations with commissioners and um, across the healthcare system about prehab. Um, so it's a really important bit of work. 
Um, the I think as Zoe's described, the um, once the evidence is there, and now we've got, as you say, high quality evidence, and you know, I've always keep the phrase in my mind that 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 means there's unlikely to be evidence to come that will change that conclusion. So we have prehab works, full stop. Um, but there's a massive challenge in how do you translate that evidence into a clinical service? Um, and how do you make that service sustainable? How do you make it resilient? How do you make it scalable? That's the, that's a, that, and that's what we've been focusing on with this program in the real world delivery of it. And you've heard Zoe use the word system already a lot. And that that's really been the focus of this program is how do you deliver it as a healthcare system? Um, and she very eloquently described the, um, I think one of the advantages of how Greater Manchester works in its healthcare is joining up ele different elements of the system to try and provide that service. So um, maybe traditionally prehab has always has been quite hospital based or centred, um, whereas this programme is very much crosses the boundaries into the public leisure centre sector. Uh, and utilising an existing framework to deliver that service close to people's home um, uh, and led by um, not one individual hospital, but a, a, ca a regional cancer network um, that really drove this uh, years back. They really did invest in that transformational funding. They um, uh, really backed prehab as an important thing when many other cancer alliances were looking at other things around pathway improvements. It really put its money behind prehab. Uh, and I think that's why we've got this unique service um, that is, um, you know, everyone, a lot of other people are quite envious of uh, because of that. Um, so for the lung pathway, um, we've... Um, we work together across all the lung cancer services in, in Greater Manchester to agree the eligibility criteria uh, of who would be suitable for community-based prehab. Um, and then worked with all of those teams to um, try and just embed the importance of this as a, as a treatment and part of a patient's treatment plan. So when we sit together as a, uh, so we call them MDT or they might be called tumor boards, we'll sit down and discuss the patient's case and <clears throat> a recommendation from that might be surgical resection. What we've really tried to push for is a treatment recommendation is surgical resection with prehab for cancer, that that's our, and it's part of the treatment. And when we're then having a consultation with a patient, that we spend as much time talking about the importance of prehab as we do about surgery and um, that the, the voice of clinicians is so powerful to discussing the benefits of um, exercise, nutritional support, psychological well-being. Um, and that, that seems to have been a key part of the success of, the, of, of engagement of the hospital teams referring patients into the programme. Um, and that program set up, um, it's, it's a web-based referral system that has key performance metrics to, to action a referral within a certain time frame, a very short time frame. Uh, that then invites a patient into a first assessment, face-to-face -face assessment, um, and then they enter into the program at those facilities that are close to home or even home exercising and, and home group individual uh, remote virtual sessions um, and we've been able to show um, that it works so um, because we know from from all the work including the Cochrane reviews about if you, de you the evidence demonstrates the increase in functional ability translates into reductions in in complications length of stay and so we've been able to show that same functional improvement and so we can assure ourselves that we should be reaping those benefits. But that, um, as you rightly pointed out, that's, that's the very minimum because we've examined the exercise component of things. What we've also, I think really the, the, some of the strongest compelling evidence is the impact on quality of life and what we see through the program and the change in um, long-term health behaviors well beyond the program. Um, in in the long term survivorship after treatment, um, so 
yeah, I think it's it's been about translating evidence into a real world service and how you build that sustainable, resilient and scalable model. So much, Matt and Zoe. It's just phenomenal to hear how a real world program can work so seamlessly like that. Um, here in Melbourne, we don't currently offer prehab to our lung cancer patients. And certainly there's some particular barriers around that that we've experienced, mainly being in terms of um, patients getting their histology back and then going into surgery or being put on the wait list for surgery very, very quickly. So often only having about two weeks between being diagnosed and having lung resection. And that's why it was so great in um, the systematic review that uh, you led, Catherine, looking at that subgroup analysis that showed that, in fact, um, you know, studies that had less than two weeks of prehab had similar or um, no difference in outcomes than those that had longer than two weeks. Um, but I was just wondering, Matt and Zoe, what you found in terms of barriers to that very short time frame that we often see in this population. And it sounds, I'm really intrigued by your online referral system and how that works seamlessly, how you've, um, if you found any barriers with uh, the clinicians referring or patients being really overwhelmed during that time too, where it is only two weeks, they found out they've got surgery in two weeks because they're sort of the same, the main barriers that we've found clinically to implementing something like this? Um, so absolutely, I think um, those barriers are very clear and we have experienced them as well, but um, there's been a lot of learning that we've done. So um, to start with, we did a lot of co-production with patients who'd experienced cancer when we first started. And one of the key messages they gave us was that actually, and it, I mean, it pains me as an occupational therapist, but if you've got your oncologist or your surgeon saying to you, you need to be doing this, it's important, it's part of your preparation for your surgery, they will absolutely do it. So we really knew we had to educate all the clinical teams so that as Matt described, you know, in the same breath as saying, I'm really sorry to tell you that you've got a cancer diagnosis, but what we're going to do is we're going to refer you into this program. You're going to get a phone call in the next couple of days. You're going to come to a local leisure centre and then you're going to be somebody working with you to do some exercise at the level that's possible for you in this short period of time. And it's going to really make a big difference to your surgery. So that's one of the first things. The second thing that we learned very quickly is that um, obviously we know for lung patients, exercise you know as Catherine's systematic review has demonstrated is incredibly beneficial and so I think there was an enthusiasm if I could say it that way to try and refer patients as quickly as possible in the pathway but what we found by doing so is that actually when patients were still in the diagnostic um, part of the pathway and there was still some lack of clarity or final decision making about their diagnosis and their treatment they weren't in the right headspace to engage in the service in the community and also um, because of the model we use where we're working with our um, exercise specialist colleagues in the leisure in community um, you know we would have patients coming to their local leisure center and the only question on their mind was do I have cancer what kind of treatment am I going to be having trying to actually meaningfully engage them at that point in a very um, productive, positive, successful prehab program really was difficult. So we made the decision that we really had to keep it that somebody was diagnosed at that point and then referred. And then there was a very quick two day turnaround. And then what we have found then is that, yes, we might only have two or three weeks and often we do only have two or three weeks, but we have found that even by somebody doing six or seven sessions, which actually we've, we've published some data around this, you know, six or seven prehab sessions, it still makes a difference. Even just the positive mindset, the physiological changes we can make in that short period of time, the muscle strength, the increase in their functional tests. Um, what we do find, which is a barrier still, is that often we try and do a preoperative assessment. So we do four assessments. We do one at the beginning, one pre-op, one when somebody's come back from their surgery for starting their rehab, and then another one when they're discharged. And sorry, we do do a fifth one a year later to see what's happening for the person at that point. But what we found is that pre-op assessment, we would often miss that because it's just feasibility that, you know, we plan to do it on the Wednesday and suddenly they're brought in for their surgery on the Tuesday. So I think that has been a barrier, but luckily 
we were able to do enough of those assessments that when it came to doing our evaluation and convincing commissioners that this needed to be sustained, we had that data. So hopefully that answers some of the question that you had, Nicola. Thank you, Zoe. No, that's that's wonderful. I might just um, ask one extra question. It sounds like you have absolutely amazing accessibility to this program through the community leisure centres. I'm coming from a major metropolitan hospital where we're looking at implementing something similar across different population groups. Do you have any uh, online resources, either for clinicians or participants, that they can access and do this sort of program remotely if needed? Yeah. So we have, um, we didn't originally, um, but the pandemic, as with everybody, really made us um, have to rethink the way we delivered our service. For a long, long time, we were very focused on face-to-face, -face, um, you know, gym-based sessions. Um, but because of the pandemic, what we have done is we've created lots of resources, so lots of videos. We've got a YouTube channel and we've got different levels of videos depending on the baseline of the patient and what they're able to engage in. Um, we have a lot of home exercise packs that we've spent a lot of time and resource on making sure they're really high quality. And again, they're really graded to individual patients. Um, our exercise specialists will still work with patients one-to-one, -one, whether it's over the phone, over video, um, video calling, um, or again, with the patients um, coming to group exercise sessions um, via video calls. Um, and then we also have lots of other resources that we signpost people to so we have our website which is the prehab for cancer website which anyone can access nationally and internationally which has got lots of resources on um, and I've also worked with um, CR UK which is a charity based in the UK um, for cancer research and preparing some universal prehab um, resources which includes videos and leaflets um, so we, we do a lot of signposting but ultimately um, the way the pathway works is that they have that exercise specialist that they're working with, they get their exercise prescription, and then they, for whatever means is going to meet their needs, is the mode of delivery of their prehabilitation. I was just going to um, just go back a little bit to some of the, when we we're talking about the barriers, there were just a few things that sprung to mind um, uh, that uh, from a, a clinician perspective and talking to my colleagues and uh, at the outset of this, I think there definitely is um, a, a perception of the risk of overwhelming a patient at the time of a cancer diagnosis. Um, and we face this in a few scenarios. Uh, stopping smoking is the other uh, area at the time of a cancer diagnosis, the perception of overwhelming someone. Um, but in both scenarios, prehab, tobacco dependency, generally I think reflecting on all of it that is generally a clinician perception not a patient perception and it generally comes from a place of um uh insecurity in the in and confidence in broaching these topics and having the confidence to discuss exercise um and i think if we spend the time talking to patients about if we were to say in a 40 minute consultation spend 39 minutes on the cancer diagnosis at the end say it, it, we should do some exercise as well the that person receiving that information will take the level of importance is all about the diagnosis um whereas actually if we spend some time on it we and, and highlight the importance of it and use some of the resources that are out there that helps to train clinicians in how to do this well, then we, we can be the vehicles to improve the engagement and reap those rewards that the programme will bring. Um, there are really, uh, I really like some of the, the, some of the UK resources. There's one called movingmedicine.ac.uk. It's a website um, that I've, lots of people fed into like Sport England and a few other um, uh, teams. And it's just, it's about how do healthcare professionals discuss physical activity? And there's some really nice stuff in there, dead simple. Uh, if you've got five minutes in a consultation, how can you do that well? And even the simplest bits of advice. So instead of saying, you know, I think it would be really good for you if we were able to, you know, get you more active. If you reframe that to say, what do you think the benefits might be if we were able to help you be more physically active? And then just asking the person themselves to describe the benefits plants that seed of behavioural change. And so they're, they're simple things, but 
they're quite impactful and it gives you the confidence to bring it into your own consultations um and i've never we've not i don't think a face now in these in the, the years of doing this now ever faced a scenario of someone saying no this is too much so i don't want to talk about this actually me and zoe both see this all the time that the time of a cancer diagnosis is the most horrible loss of control in your life that you can't control that diagnosis you can't control how treatment is going to work you lose all of that control but this is one of the ways you can take back some control in your preparation for uh, for treatment and that and it's such a positive part of a horrible situation if we give it the time uh, and that's where it really starts at that moment the engagement into the program Thanks, Matt. That's excellent and certainly reflects a lot of uh, experiences that I think we've had over here in, in Australia as well with patients wanting to really have that sense of control of, of part of what's going on in the process. I might just go back quickly to resources and uh, I think now would be a good time to sort of link in and Catherine, maybe do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about the pulmonary rehab toolkit update and the resources there for clinicians? So the pulmonary rehabilitation toolkit um, is a freely available toolkit for anyone globally um, and we've just gone through it's, it's hosted by the Lung Foundation of Australia um, and there's a very big team of expert clinicians, researchers, uh, professional staff, a huge team behind it with resources about running pulmonary rehabilitation and in the latest update, we've actually been able to include sections specific to lung cancer. So prior to this time, it was really focused on pulmonary rehabilitation for COPD and other respiratory conditions. But we've got now specific sort of advice, instructions, uh, guidance for lung cancer. So it, it's a great um, a great toolkit. It's targeted primarily at health professionals. Um, certainly the Lung Foundation Australia, which links from it, has information for consumers as well. But it's a good go-to for people working in the space specifically of lung cancer and maybe considering how to, to set up a pulmonary rehab program or adapt their program to the sort of the pre-operative or post-operative time phases. Thanks, Catherine. Um, the other thing about the pulmonary rehab toolkit is that it's also available in Mandarin online in addition to, to English. In the toolkit, there are also things like referral letters if you're referring to a, you know, to a GP, communicating with other health professionals, there's assessment forms. It's sort of a fairly practical toolkit of here are lots of resources to help you get started in setting up a program. So I was going to just ask Catherine a bit more um, about her systematic review um, and just to give the framework. Um, so within the design of the Prehab the Cancer program, um, we would, took a lot of advice from academic exercise experts about um, going back to if you've only got two or three weeks and you've only got six sessions with somebody, what should you be doing with them? Um, and we really focused on kind of that HIT approach and kind of using an exercise bike, um, in groups, but really trying to do that intensive treat, um, treatment and exercise with somebody. Um, but we're always considering the kind of mechanisms of prehabilitation and trying to understand more about what we should be focusing on. You know, there's a lot of evidence as well about um, strengthening and sarcopenia and trying to avoid, you know, um, any kind of muscle deconditioning because we know that also has an impact on preoperative complications. So I suppose I was just going to ask Catherine. Um, if there was kind of any um, further findings she would want to um, describe about what types of exercise prehab services like ours should be really focusing on. Thanks Zoe, it's such an important question and in fact we had hoped to do some subgroup analyses to actually really answer this question and, and to pull out you know if you were offering an exercise program that just had aerobic training or just had high intensity interval training or just had resistance training or what combination what would be ideal because you're right, resources are finite and the time is so um, so limited, but we didn't have the data to be able to do those subgroup analyses. Hopefully in five years for the next update, we may. And in fact, that's, that's certainly a, a question for future research in this area. We really need to understand what would be the ideal exercise training program for the general group, but then of course we, we need it targeted for that, you know, that individual person uh, going through treatment. I mean, the, the, certainly the common type of exercise training in all the studies is aerobic exercise. That's been part of the original first programs that were tested and has continued through. And I think that's really um, to do with, with the thought of the, the initial target is VO2 peak, 
you know, getting VO2 peak higher, getting over that risk threshold for risk of complications after surgery. And, you know, that target aerobic aerobic training has, has been, um, you know, theoretically what, what the, uh, the purpose of that is. But in fact, most of the studies do include resistance training. And we know that people with lung cancer have such significant issues with muscle dysfunction. So that's also really important. Um, and some programs have stretching and, and other aspects as well. But we'd love to say with more confidence what the best type of program would be, but I'm hoping there'll be many more trials in the next five years and we'll be able to answer that question. Um, and could I just follow up? Because obviously um, your critical systematic review is very much focused on um, pulmonary complications. So I suppose, again, you know, within our service, we're not just working with patients with lung cancer, we're working with patients with different types of cancers. So I suppose it's that digging even deeper to think, is the different um, types of exercise regimes that we should be focusing on for different cancer types, different surgical pathways? Or do we think that actually it's much more, um, you know, it, it applies across the board? Because we know certainly that um, one of the um, symptoms that patients describe and report most um, from our lung cancer patients is that shortness of breath um, and obviously that's both a physiological physical symptom as, and as well it's the kind of the mental well-being side of that as well so I suppose it's the interesting thing of um, how much can we um, you know use the same approach for different types of cancer pathways or how much do we really need to be tailoring the exercises depending on what type of surgical onslaught a different patient might be having. I agree. I think it should be tailored and, and even more so to, to the individual person and what their assessment findings are. Um, obviously, in these, these trials, it's a, a protocolised intervention that's somewhat individualised. But, you know, we, we see people coming in to have surgery who are actually quite fit before surgery. And, and, you know, that's some of the problems with some of the exercise testing we're seeing before surgery. There's a ceiling effect, but maybe they have other impairments and, and, respirate, and, and sorry, peripheral muscle dysfunction and, and issues like that. So I think tailoring the exercise prescription to that initial assessment as much as we can is critical. But Zoe, I agree with your point across different types of cancers. Um, presentation is different, the symptoms are different, and likely the mechanisms of exercise and the related sort of risk of surgical complications is going to be different. Not sure we have the data yet to, to sort of inform how it is different, but um, clinically and theoretically, I, I hypothesise it, it would be. And that's where from the lung cancer point of view, it, it makes sense for a combined aerobic plus or minus resistance exercise program if you have time. I might um, bring you in here, Nicola, because I know you had a question about um, exercise testing that kind of links in with some of the discussion we, we've just had. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I did have one question for you, Catherine, around um, measuring change post prehabilitation and how we can do that clinically you know in a in a real world setting because you've mentioned that um, you know these exercise trials have shown a um, significant outcome in terms of vo2 max improvement but that's not necessarily translating into a significant change in something like the six minute walk distance testing that we more typically do um, in the clinical setting. So I was just wondering, you know, your thoughts around that and whether it's just that we need um, higher level evidence to support that change that we would expect to see, a change in VO2 max leading to an increase in six minute walk distance, or whether we need to be looking at different outcome measures that we collect clinically. Thanks, Nicola. I might talk about the Cochrane review and then I'd love to hear from Zoe and Matt about what, what you're implementing in practice around testing. I mean, one of the problems we had with the Cochrane review was that we, we have not many trials really when you start breaking it down to these secondary outcome measures like exercise capacity or functional exercise capacity. So for the outcome of VO2P, when we looked at this measure before and after the exercise program, all in the preoperative phase, we only had two trials in the end. Um, so this is a small, very limited conclusions and small amount of data. Um, but when we, it, you know, statistically significant findings, we found that the, you know, compared to a control group, the intervention group would expect a mean difference of you know, improvement of 3.4 millilitres per kilogram per minute of VO2 peak. So that's a, that's a great finding. We were able to say that that was moderate certainty evidence. And so that's where your, your comment around sort of the, the confidence of knowing that VO2 peak we're expecting it will improve with the intervention comes from. 
And when you're when you're doing these Cochrane reviews, we look at sort of the certainty of evidence and grading, and depending on how the evidence is is fitting along many different metrics, we we sort of downgrade or upgrade the certainty. And so for the the outcome of VO two peak, we downgraded it because the individual trials had had significant limitations, and also the sample size was very low, so we didn't have a precise estimate of effect. But we actually upgraded at one point because the magnitude of difference was so high. So that's where we arose at the moderate certainty evidence, which is which is great that we we can conclude that. When we then go over to look at six minute walk test, which as you describe is much more commonly used, um, and in fact was more commonly used in the trials, we had we could include um, six RCTs in this meta analysis. Uh, much easier, much quicker to do. Um, we we had more data and we did have a statistically significant difference. So what we found was that, you know, the intervention group compared to the control group would expect a difference of 30 metres of, of the six-minute walk test, and that's hitting the above the minimally clinical, clinically important difference in lung cancer. Um, so whilst it was statistically significant, the evidence was really downgraded um, and that was only down to a very low conclusion and that's where we're sort of very uncertain about the effect on this outcome and that was just because of extra limitations with, with these with this outcome. Um, again, individual trials had limitations. Um, the One of the biggest problems was the statistical um, heterogeneity. The, if, you're, if you're really into meta-analysis, things like the I squared was very high for this outcome. There were you know, really different results among individual trials. And, um, and finally, with this one, um, we also downgraded it because of the... Um, the 95% confidence interval and that was falling below and above the minimally clinically important difference. So I'm sorry that's a very long answer to explain some of the statistics and decision making around it but basically uh, what I'm what I'm trying to say here is I think there is an improvement in the six minute walk test as well. I think we're just limited with the data we have so far and so you know, it's great that we can say with moderate certainty that VO2 peak increases. I hope, you know, in my heart, it's also the same for the six-minute walk test, but based on the results so far, it's not, you know, we've had to downgrade it quite significantly. But I'd love to, love to hear from Madam Zoe about your, your clinical uh, experience in this area. Um, yeah, so I, I completely agree that the uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test just is, is not feasible uh, as your um evidence of functional improvement across a, a in a real world service so that means we have to look for something else that is reproducible and evidence-based um we we did there was a lot of discussion at the outset of prehab for cancer in in lung cancer the incremental shuttle walk has more evidence behind it than the six minute walk test but that's the opposite is true in other cancers like colorectal and where where we've been running the programs and I think where we will settle is a six minute walk test throughout um so uh and my sense is that there is and I think the evidence supports it that the um the incremental shuttle walk and probably the six minute walk test underestimate vo2 max particularly towards the lower end and the ceiling effect is probably at a lower level with those tests. And so in a prehab program, which are often the, um, uh, we are trying to get people fitter, but it's not the very frail going through prehab services. Um, and so in those, I think it's harder to see the incremental benefit in the, in the uh, shuttle or the six minute walk test because you hit the ceiling effect sooner where you really see benefit is the lower you're starting six minute walk test and we're starting to see some really interesting data because our prehab program is moving and expanding beyond the realms of this systematic review and doing it in oncology patients um, and in radiotherapy patients who are less fit generally than surgical patients and they have a lower baseline six minute walk test but their improvements are more significant than the surgical cohort we get about on average a 40 meter improvement in a surgical cohort it's around 60 meters in the oncology cohort um, and I, but I just think that is the effect you you see the bit the bigger benefit when your base when your starting point is lower. Um, so it's clear it's such an important metric, and it's what's because we've got the clinically important levels that it gives prehab programs 
a quality assurance metric. So if we are to show those mini, uh, minimally important improvements, um, we should be we should have the assurance that you'll reap the benefits that the evidence base shows you'll you'll get. So uh, the six minute walk, I think, is here to stay. Um, you know, it has its flaws and it has its um, and its issues. And in lung, it's not as well studied as some of the others. But I, ultimately, I think that is will be the reproducible thing. Uh, Zoe, I don't know what you think about it. Yeah, so it's interesting. We've had a lot of um, heated discussions about the incremental shuttle walk versus the six minute walk. Um, and what I, all I was going to add is that um, I think it's really difficult when you're trying to design a real world service, when you're trying to counterbalance needing to demonstrate the evidence of the value of the service and the impact of the service on your patients versus trying to find outcome measures that are going to really help you to inform your interventions and your exercise prescriptions. So going back to what Catherine was saying before, um, you know, we do use a very personalized approach in prehab for cancer um, and the assessments that we're doing, um, part of it is about us having to evaluate the service and being able to demonstrate the impact it has. And, and as, as um, Matt's describing, you know, how it aligns to the, the literature and the evidence base. But there is this other element of, well, actually, um, you know, what's going to be the best assessment for that individual patient to predict what we should be doing with them in terms of their interventions. And so where we struggle a little bit is, as Matt's described, if we've got somebody who's a presenting to prehab, who might be like Matt and I, quite fit people, <laughs> dare I say it, um, you know, somebody who might already be doing exercise, but we know there's a likelihood that they're going to deteriorate as they go through their treatment pathway. Um, you know, an incremental shuttle walk test would be the, the, the better up outcome measure because actually that's probably going to be um, more helpful to us to understand what that person's baseline, baseline fitness is, what, you know, how much we can be pushing them in their prehab. Um, but if we were to try and do an incremental shuttle walk test with a frail, older patient who's probably not exercised for many years, um, it, it's, it's a difficult test to do with that group of people. And so it's been really difficult because with, with, although we're doing a very personalized um, delivery of service, we are trying to find outcome measures that we can use across the board because otherwise what we find is we get this very noisy data where it's really hard to pick apart what's going on. Um, and so we've kind of settled on the six minute walk test. We've probably gone a little bit for the kind of the lowest common denominator in terms of the types of patients that we're supporting. Because also there is an element of um, us having a finite resource within the service. I mean, we've had over 3000 patients access the service, so it's a large service. But I think we're always really aware that we need to be providing um, you know, catering to the needs of the patients. Some pa patients need less, some patients need more. Um, and the patients like Matt described, the ones who are now in the oncology pathways, um, we really recognize that actually by doing the proper assessments with them, by understanding what their baselines are, um, and then by doing very targeted interventions with them, we really are able to show those clinically significant improvements as Matt's described. Um, but it's bit, but it's been, you know, we're we're only four years in, and already we've kind of gone on this journey, even in terms of what outcome measures we're using, um, and, and that's not just in physiological outcome measures, the, the quality of life outcome measures we use, the nutritional outcome measures we use, functional outcome measures, frailty, etc. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's it's always helpful to know what's happening within the literature and what's happening within other real world services as well. Catherine, I might um, go back to you now and and just ask on that. Um, particular kind of topic. I know that a number of the trials in the Cochrane review kind of only included higher risk patients, you know, patients who are more likely to develop a post-operative pulmonary complication. And I know Zoe's just touched on sort of limited resources. So should we indeed be trying to target our interventions to those higher risk groups do you think and I'd be interested to hear what happens in Manchester is it you know that everyone who's referred receives some sort of triage service or do you do you, are there particular groups that you would target as being high risk 
Lara, you, you're right. The uh, the trials included in the Cochrane review were varied. So some of them specifically were targeting people with um, particular characteristics. So there were some that had patients needed at least one preoperative risk factor for developing complications. So they used things like age or um, respiratory comorbidities, BMI, et cetera. Um, a couple of the trials targeted only people with lung cancer and COPD. Uh, other trials targeted only people going through um, open thoracotomy surgery, which has a high risk of complications. So they're really varied. We'd like in the future to be able to, to break down and do some, again, subgroup analyses to, to look at other, you know, other findings different if people uh, have one or more risk factors for, for a complication afterwards. Are they different going on what Matt was just saying about patients with, um, with frailty? Are they different with patients who are starting at a lower level? different for people with COPD, but we, we really don't have enough information. It's so the, the field is so new, despite us being talking, you know, there's, there's people been interested in this for a while, but we're still very new compared to other areas. So we don't really have that information. I mean, I mean clinically, of course, it makes sense. If you have to, if you, if you have to, you have a small amount of resources and you can't offer that service to everyone. I mean, of course, the program that Zoe and Matt have is amazing that everyone can access it. But if you can't have everyone, then then yes, I suppose targeting people. We have you know, very good evidence on the preoperative risk factors for developing complications, and and those were the patients that that you might target. Interestingly, some of those risk factors are lower levels of physical activity and poor exercise capacity. So they typically are the patients we are. You know, aiming to target with exercise training anyway. It's, it's not our not our fitter, our younger, active people um, that, that may or may not have any other risk factors. This goes back for me back to the modalities and the fact that within a prehab program, um, you're not just looking at exercise; you're looking at nutrition and well being as well, um, as well as smoking cessation, out reducing alcohol intake, anemia management, etc. So I suppose the way that we thought about the service when we started was, um, you know. When it comes to the exercise, we know that's probably going to have the biggest impact and improvements for, your, you know, your more frail, more high risk group. Whereas um, when you might think about your lower risk group, um, yes, they're still going to benefit from some increased exercise and maintaining any exercise. And, you know, because always there's always a risk people might stop doing exercise when they get that cancer diagnosis if they don't have that kind of reassurance and good advice and um, from professionals. Um, but then it's that understanding what impact the um, it, this treatment pathway is going to have in terms of their nutritional needs and their mental well-being. So I think it's that understanding that actually somebody um, who might be physically well going into a cancer treatment pathway or, or, or functionally physically better um, will actually, you know, they're just as likely to deteriorate mentally or from a nutritional perspective. And so it's almost like um, what we do in Manchester is we have, um, we use the, what's called the universal target model, um, which is quite well known. So it's that idea that you've, um, you know, there's a triangle and, um, you know, either you've got those universal interventions, those targeted or that specialist at the top of the triangle. Um, what we do within our program is um, we assess people at the beginning, partly to provide a personalized intervention plan for them but also to understand, are they a universal patient who needs more of a universal approach, um, which is more hands off, um, still being able to be in contact, but kind of really encouraging and facilitating more of an independent engagement in exercise and other interventions, or is it more of a kind of targeted, um, supervised approach, which is poor, probably more your, your frail and older patients who are kind of phys you know, physically needing more input. Um, and, and that's really does guide us. But but I think what we have done, which I think um, might be a little bit daunting when you're first trying to create these kind of services, but it's been brilliant to be able to do is we have just opened this up to everybody within those pathways. So we haven't said, you know, you can only be referred if you meet certain risk criteria. Um, we've got some eligibility criteria, which is more about safety. So it's more about recognizing that there are some patients where it might be unsafe for them to come and exercise in the community in a leisure environment um, and they might need to be a, a lot more specialist within a hospital environment but that's a very small percentage of the surgical lung cancer patients you know maybe five or ten percent and the majority of the patients are referred through and then it is just about stratifying the interventions that they receive and the level of um, monitoring and support that they receive from the prehab for cancer staff members um, so so yeah, so it, it is, but I think what we are trying to do in Greater Manchester is we keep on throwing this word around prehab for all, 
So how do we do this for all cancer patients across the board in Greater Manchester, of which there are about 20,000 diagnosed every year? Um, <laughs> you can see the few wrinkles on mine and Matt's heads. Um, <laughs> but, but it is understanding that we probably do need to take a very stratified approach to how we might go about doing that. And um, where we will have finite resource, it's how you apply that resource in the best way. That's fabulous. Thank you for that. We're having such a great discussion. And I would just like to move the focus a little bit. We've talked a lot about the obviously the objective measures and findings of the Cochrane Review and some of the objective measures uh, that are used in your program and quality of life. And I'm, I know that you've published that evaluation um, last year. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about the patient experience and, and whether you've collected information on the patient experience and have plans to let us in on, um, on that information soon too. Yeah, so actually, um, so we've done various things. We have, as I described earlier on, we, we've, we've co-produced this program. So we've got um, patients who've experienced cancer who've been with us through the entire development of the program. There, we've got members of our steering group who are people who, um, affected by cancer, um, members of our lung subgroup um, that we meet with around the lung pathway. Um, we also, we've done a lot of focus groups, which were actually led by the patients affected by cancer. And the, the feedback was predominantly very, very positive. Um, you know, it's really wonderful to be able to see. From a more of an academic approach, we've worked with um, health psychologists based at the University of Manchester, um, who were doing an acceptability research study um, with um, our program. Um, unfortunately, they did it at the time during the pandemic. So what we were trying to do is find a mixture between patients who'd been referred, who'd accepted the offer and engaged in the offer, and then patients who'd been referred and not necessarily taken up the offer. So we have about an 80% uptake rate. And the 20% that don't take up the offer, the majority of them, it's more about circumstance. So it's more about the fact that their surgery might have been brought forwards or they've not been able to engage for some reason. But there is a small percentage of patients that choose not to engage. So we really wanted to try and understand the kind of qualitative data and the kind of the, the anecdotal feedback. And we're literally just um, submitted two papers for publication which is a lot of really rich um, qualitative data. All, uh, it's majority of the, the sample, there was about 20 or so patients that were um, interviewed. The majority of them are engagers. So it's, it is mainly more focusing on the benefits and the kind of what they've, how they've really benefited from engaging in the service, um, which is obviously lovely to read, <laughs> but recognizing that, you know, it's also would be very helpful to understand a bit more of the barriers and what might be preventing people from engaging. Um, but overwhelmingly, um, people talk a lot about the support that they receive, the psychological benefits they receive, the improved quality of life. Um, and just uh, going back to what Matt was saying about that sense of control, so feeling really empowered, um, you know, feeling a little bit daunted to begin with, but, but feeling very reassured and then really building their confidence. And then, you know, something that would have previously been something they would never consider doing, going along to the gym suddenly became something that was normalized for them. Um, so, yeah, so we'll happily share those papers once they hopefully get accepted for publication. Oh, that's fantastic. We'll, we'll be sure to be keeping an eye out for them. Um, we might draw to a close um, now, but I think maybe if we just uh, finish with some take home messages. So maybe, Catherine, if you want to um, tell us what you think might be the next steps for research and then if we could hear a bit about what what you think the key important messages would be for someone who's thinking about implementing a, a prehabilitation program, that'd be great. So Lara, I can start with firstly, my key take home messages around future directions for research. I think um, for me, one of the things I'd really love to see in the next few years are trials looking at different types of exercise programs. And so we can really narrow down in what is the optimal duration, aerobic resistance, moderate intensity, HIIT training, what, what characteristics, so we can prescribe a much more tailored approach to our general cohort of people, people with lung cancer, but then obviously individualise that to the next level. So I'd love to see that. I think that'll help us with more certainty. I think we'll hopefully have uh, stronger results when we know how to tailor exercise with even more precision. Um, and hopefully that only just carries over to better outcomes for patients. And Zoe and Matt, any, any tips? for people wanting to implement their own program, having heard your great successes? So I think 
there, there's always going to be um, local solutions depending on geography, on population, on resource. Um, but what I hope's come across is that um, if we're truly going to do this, um, it's got to be something that's sustainable, resilient and scalable. And that is generally doing things across a healthcare system. And we meet lots of people who are really um, such dedicated um, healthcare professionals trying to implement prehab and often and feel like they're just banging their head against a brick wall. Um, and that is often trying to deliver um, new services within an individual clinic or an individual institution. I really hope that healthcare systems look to implement these um, services um, in like we have um, that relates the healthcare system to the public leisure system and a cancer alliance that kind of tripartite that has really been the success to the delivery. Yeah, and if I could just add, um, and it really aligns with what Matt just said, I think that co-production element is really, really important. So I've obviously described a lot about working with patients affected by cancer, but working across a system. So, you know, again, I think a lot of the success of our programme is based on the fact that it was healthcare coming together with leisure and exercise experts working really closely together. And then with the feedback as well of the patients, and that's had a really big impact um, and that's really led us to focusing very heavily on the education to healthcare professionals. So I think it's, assume, you know, not assuming that every um, healthcare professional thinks it's a good idea that patients do exercise before they have their cancer treatment. Um, you know, unfortunately, we'd hear occasional things where an anaesthetist had told a patient that they shouldn't be exercising, you know, shock horror. And so um, we really did spend a lot of time and energy working across the board trying to really educate and upskill all the professionals that were going to come in contact with the patients um, because we knew it would have such a big impact that one sentence saying this is going to be really helpful for you we really think you should do this just knowing how much of an impact that would be in terms of the uptake and the engagement from the patients and their family members so I think the education piece is really really important you know family members you they're so keen when a patient gets a cancer diagnosis to kind of wrap them up in cotton wool and put them on the sofa and give them cups of tea. Um, so I think it's it's really about how you really break down those barriers and you really change the way people think. So the education piece is really, really important. Brilliant. It's been so wonderful to have this discussion and, and hear about you know, the great evidence out of the Cochrane Review and such a successful program over in Manchester. Really appreciate it everyone's time um, on the panel this morning so a very big thank you from Pedro to all of you for being involved thanks